What's up, everyone? This is Jonathan Salmon, and I'm starting a new segment today. It's going to be called Watch It or Skip It. So came up with this idea because <clears throat> there's so many UFC Bellator one events that sometimes it's hard to know which event you should actually tune in for. So this weekend, we have a big card, UFC 241. I have a feeling that everyone's going to know where I fall on this one just because, you know, the card is so absolutely stacked. But nevertheless, this is still a good place to start as any. And, you know, this 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 fight card is really, really insane. So in the main event, we have Daniel Cormier versus Stipe Miocic. And it's a rematch of their initial bout that they had at UFC 226, where Daniel Cormier knocked out Stipe Miocic in the first round. Pretty devastating kind of stuff. Um, but this rematch, I heard a lot of people are saying that it's not super intriguing or there's nothing else to really see. We kind of got the whole idea because Cormier shut down Miocic so easily in the first fight, quote unquote easily. But in reality, it's really a fight that it does make a ton of sense to get that rematch, especially since Stipe defended his belt more than any other heavyweight champion. And Daniel Cormier, even though he picked up that victory in the first fight and everything was planned, everything went to plan, it doesn't always mean that the outcome is just going to be the exact same. So the main event is already a pretty strong <laughs> fight to go off of just to sell off that. But the co-main event and some of the other fights on the card, it just solidifies this one. So in the co-main event, we have Anthony Pettis versus Nate Diaz, who's returning after a three year long layoff. Now, there's going to be a ton of questions whether or not Diaz is still the Diaz of old. Um, I mean, the best performance that I've seen him put in besides his Conor McGregor fights were was the Michael Johnson fight where he came in in super ripped shape. He looked like just ready to go five rounds if need be. And I mean, I think he's always ready to go five rounds. The, the Diaz brothers are just known for the cardio. And, you know, he's fighting Anthony Pettis at welterweight, which is the big, you know, caveat. It's the big difference in this kind of fight that if it was at lightweight, it would be, it could be a completely different fight. But obviously we have to wait and see. That's what makes these things so exciting, right? And we also have a middleweight bout between Yoel Romero versus Paulo Costa. I mean, if you are a fan of just superhumans doing ridiculous nonsense in the cage, then uh, you should definitely not miss that one. All right, so... Just based off those three fights, it's 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 pretty. The the card is pretty damn strong. Um, we even have Rafael Sunsau versus Corey Sanhagen. That's a sleeper fight that I'm not hearing a lot of people talk about. Uh, Drakkar Close is coming back again. Christos Yagos. That's another barn burner. It seems like. And you know, there's there's quite a few fights that we have. Ki uh, Kyung Ho Kang. Versus Brandon Davis, another, another big fight right there, in my opinion. You know, these are the fights that no one is really talking about. And these are the kind, these are the fighters that we have to really watch out for in their separate divisions. Uh, Rafael Sun Tsao, Corey Sanhagen, Kyung Ho Kang, Brandon Davis. These, these guys and all these guys in Bantamweight have tremendous potential, tremendous potential. So, I'm really looking forward to seeing all those fights. But as for the breakdowns, we just want to I want to get to the juicy stuff, you know. I don't want to not to say any of the other fights are a waste of time, but I do want to focus on fights that I think is most intriguing to the general public. That Paulo Costa versus Yoel Romero matchup is 
it is going I, I mean look this is the expectation that you know they both look like superheroes they both have crazy power they're both super explosive and they're both kind of underrated in their skill a lot of, a lot of time people talk about their power and their their strength their explosion but a lot of times people don't mention the nuance and the the different tactics that both men use in their fights Yoel Romero you know he's very much a a sit back wait kind of pick his opportunities and then explode into what either a double leg takedown or into some kind of powerful strike you know he's not a big combination striker but you know he, you'll see him throw one two and 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 uh, punch to kicks you know from time to time but a lot of times it's really one big big heavy shot and from there you know he's he's back to being on the hunt if he didn't put you out with that shot if he didn't get you down on the ground with that takedown then he's going to conserve his energy again this is why even though he's so heavily muscled in the third round he still has gas because he's not just always exploding always exploding always exploding you know i think that was something that he used to do earlier in his career but i think as he's matured he's kind of understood particularly after the first robert whitaker fight we kind of saw him taper his taper his explosion down a little bit and kind of pace himself a bit more and after that it's just i mean we all saw the rematch with whitaker and you can argue who you thought won that fight. I mean, Romero did the most damage. Whitaker won more rounds. But at the end of the day, you know, he came out with the loss. But, you know, what we learned from that is that he's not, he's going to be very patient. He's not going to be this guy that's just going to completely gas himself out, especially not at this stage in the game, I believe. I believe you've gotten to a point where, He's kind of understood exactly what he's good at. He's understood exactly how much he should be, how much output he should be using to really conserve his gas tank. On the other side, we have Young Gun and Paulo Costa, who has been pretty much destroying everybody since he's joined the UFC. You know, he's he's only 28 years old, and the the kid hits hard. Hits hard. A lot of power, a lot of explosion, just like Yoel. You know, but but the, the the last time he fought was in July 2018 against Uriah Hall. Uh, we haven't really seen him since then. You know, uh, been doing some film study on him a bit, and uh, from what I've noticed, he really is very mature in terms of his ability to and willingness to strike the body. You know, he, he doesn't necessarily just headhunt. And a lot of a lot of people and a lot of strikers, particularly, you know, when you find in once you find an MMA, a lot of headhunters, a lot of guys willing to just exchange and not really mix it up to the body, not really mix it up to the to the legs. You know, it, it's either I mean. Leg kicks are very prominent too. You know, you will see a lot of fighters use those leg kicks. But a lot of head hunting and not a lot of body work. Not as much body work as should that should be utilized. Because, you know, when you start attacking the body, particularly against a wrestler, it, it really can shut down that that double leg. It can shut down those takedowns. You know, it, it's something that I think will find more prominence in MMA as we continue to move forward, but Costa has already gotten a memo and he uses a lot of body shots. So when he goes in there against UL, expect him to mix things up. He's probably going to try and walk him down a little bit. You know, he, he's young, he's undefeated. He has that kind of chip on his so shoulder where you go, all right, well, I finished every last person that I've come up against. So, why wouldn't I walk you down and try and impose my will? So, but he's gonna have to be he gonna have to be careful with that with uh, Yoel because Yoel, like I said, he's going to pick his spots. He's going to explode. Costa's gonna have to put a little bit of volume on 
Romero, I think, in this fight. He has to put he has to dish out the volume. He has to strike the body a lot. But can he has to use a lot of feints. He has to draw out that explosive attack out of Romero if he's gonna really try to capitalize off of it. I mean, with the body work and all the maturity that we've seen so far from him, it's not something out of the realm of possibility, but we'll have to wait and see exactly how he approaches the fight. For Romero, on the other hand, you know, same thing. He's going to have to faint. He's going to have to really sell his explosions. And when he has Costa convinced that he's going to enter, he needs to just, I don't want to say launch everything into one shot as a striking coach. I'm just like, no, don't do that. Use your jab, you know, control the space, control the distance and everything like that. But it probably would behoove Yoel Romero to net one time, you know, really draw out, really get Paulo Costa comfortable in a striking match and then take him to the ground or pace himself fake the takedown, come up top with a either an overhand or a knee body kick. You know, he can fight from both stances as we can have we seen. So he can really mix things up. If he goes southpaw, using that body kick all day, you know, left straight all day, really f- and and going to the body with that that cross can really mix things up as well. If he goes to the body with that cross and then, you know, decides to transition to a double leg, it can really really mask his movement. So I think that's a big, that would be really big. Both guys have to, use, should use body shots. I I mean, I got a feeling Costa is going to be more, you know, more disciplined in that, especially since we've already seen that he's used it in all of his other fights. But yeah, definitely body work is going to be a big, big factor, I think, in that fight. Uh, as far as the, the co-main event, Anthony Pettis versus Nate Diaz. Pettis was coming off of the victory against Steven Thompson. Uh, he was pretty much getting beat up the entire fight. You know, he did land some really powerful leg kicks. He did kind of, you know, wait, bide his time. You know, a little bit love that Romero type of mentality. He, he took some damage. And once he saw opportunity, he caught Thompson slipping, he went for it. He went and did that Superman punch immediately. All right, there's no hesitation. That that's how you know there was they were training for that. They were waiting for that. They his camp, uh, Pettis and his camp. You definitely can tell that they wanted Thompson to pressure in that fight, and Thompson did pressure. He obliged. He pressured. He, he went in. He was he was jabbing up Pettis. You know he couldn't really land anything concussive. Pettis had that tight high guard, and you know, he was just looking to counter in that fight. And he, as soon as he saw that opportunity, you know, Thompson threw that sidekick when, when Pettis was already had his, has already had his back up against the cage. So at that point, you know, that sidekick is probably not as effective. I think it would probably be more effective, you know, right when, before they get that, get to that double black line. I feel like that would be a more of a, of an area where you should use that, that sidekick, but you know, obviously he couldn't have anticipated anything. And Anthony Pettis, he said, you know what? As soon as I get, I feel my back up against the cage or I feel my heel touch the back of that cage. I'm exploding. All right. And as soon as he, as soon as he throws, he, he throws something and he doesn't retract, retract quick enough. I'm going for the kill. And that's exactly what he did. You know, on, on the other hand, you know, I mean, it, for for in terms of Pettis' style, he's also very explosive. He, he's used he's utilized a good jab before in the past, but he does he does wait for his opportunities a whole lot more. Uh, did I heard Luke Thomas talking about this a bit too? I'm guilty, and you know just basically how Pettis has kind of slow in, in, in his approach to the game. He's slowed down. He's he's he picks his shots. You know, he waits a little bit longer. He picks his shots. He doesn't just, he's not a high volume striker, you know, which is, which is interesting. You know, he's more of like a precision guy. He's, he's, he's looking for that, that perfect shot. He'll set it up well uh, from time to time, but he's really just looking for that perfect shot, that perfect kick, you know, that perfect punch. He's, he's always looking 
and trying to time his opponent rather than overwhelm them with volume. But um, that is the complete opposite of the person that he's fighting. Nate Diaz is definitely a man who likes to use volume and coming forward. So Diaz, in, in my opinion, he's going to have to right out the gate. He has to just start pressuring. You know, I think Diaz is probably the naturally bigger man. You know, if he can really pressure, get his boxing to, to pressure and put Pettis up against the cage where he's still dangerous, right? As we saw in the, the his last fight. But if if he can use his boxing, uh, use hand traps, you know, I, I've seen him use a little bit of hand traps as well in the past, Diaz, you know, really use that jab, really use his one, two. And, and just get him moving backwards, right? Using that long one-two to get Pettis moving backwards, corral him with that right hook, you know, just keep circling and forcing him into the cage. If you can get him there, definitely should go into the clinch. Definitely should. You know, he did a great job against Conor McGregor doing that in both fights. He got Conor up against the cage and let him feel his body weight. Really put, the, put that, that pressure on him. You know, beating up the body constantly. This is another guy in Diaz, him and, and Nick, his brother. You know, these guys know how to put on pressure. They know how to, to tap, 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 and then hit with a, with a powerful punch, you know, and really go for the body. So that's going to be super key, I think, to defeating Anthony Pettis, you know, for Diaz. I mean... Honestly, is any I? It's been three years since Diaz has fought, so we don't know what version we're gonna see. You know, he could. I mean, at thirty four, he's not. I think he's still slightly. He's in his prime still, so he's not. You know, we're not wear and tear or anything like that. You know, unless he was training super hard in those three years, I shouldn't really expect to see too much of that uh, in the fight. So it's really, it's kind of a. It's a volume versus precision kind of matchup, you know. So, and I mean, I Nate Diaz is not in a boring fight ever. Like, I don't think I've seen a boring Nate Diaz fight unless you know he's fought wrestlers who've been able to take him down and he hasn't been able to capitalize with his submissions. Other than that, pretty much every single Nate Diaz fight is a high volume kind of matchup. So. I'm expecting him to use the pressure, clinch up with Pettis, work his body while they're up against the cage, you know, possibly even go for takedowns, you know, just to keep Pettis honest. I don't necessarily think he's going to secure takedowns or anything like that or but it's it's definitely something to keep in the mind of Pettis, you know, if he just continues to go for trips and and hit the body, go for takedowns, mixing it up, up and down, up and down. I really think that's going to throw off uh, Pettis's game and for Pettis you know Pettis has to you know he has to beat up the legs that is just like a prerequisite to fighting Diaz a Diaz brother you just beat up those legs they, they stand so heavy on the front leg it's like it's a gift but he's gonna have to be he's gonna have to work inside outside he's gonna have to mix things up to the body you know I really do think he, he he needs to make this a kind of a kicking battle more than a boxing battle. I think if he gets into a boxing exchange with Nate Diaz, who has longer reach and just loves to throw, throws high volume. Not to say that it's impossible that, that Pettis lands something himself, but if you have a superior kicking game, you should use it. You know, you should be using side kicks. He should be using the leg kicks, going to the body on occasion you know mixing up the heights constantly to the head to the body to the legs constantly using that you know and also just keep that jab out there just to keep Diaz honest and not feeling like he can just pressure in with it with impunity you know it's really about jabbing getting off the getting his head off the center line as he jabs and then hitting with a low kick off of that you know I really do think that is the key for Pettis in this fight, definitely using the kicks, keeping things at kicking range and, you know, making Diaz walk into his strikes, you know, as he's a switch, he's a switch stance fighter, Pettis, so he can work from both stances. I definitely think since 
Diaz is a southpaw working out of the orthodox stance is definitely going to be a great option for Pettis because you know at least he, the body will be open uh, the head is a little bit more open as well and inside leg kicks are definitely open as well so though it's a definite option to go into to, to orthodox stance for Pettis against Diaz now for our main event Daniel Cormier versus Stipe Miocic the rematch uh well this is going to be a very interesting fight uh, potentially because I don't see Stipe Stipe is not a, a a backward moving fighter we saw in the rematch with Junior Dos Santos even though he wasn't knocked out in that f- fight you know in that first fight in their rematch, he walked him down. He walked down Dos Santos immediately. I mean, by that time, we got an understanding that Dos Santos was a little more vulnerable to attacks if you pressure him up against the cage. But for sure, he's not. I don't see Stipe taking a back step in this fight. I see him being a little bit more intelligent, moving a little bit more, but still trying to play a bit of a pressure game against Cormier. Uh, Cormier is such a pressure fighter that, you know, in the first fight, they kind of like, they, they just crashed into each other. And that's where a lot of the work, you know, started happening. So I think the big difference for Stipe in this fight is having way more of an educated jab, jabbing to the body as Cormier comes forward. Because Cormier, you're not going to get Cormier to really back off. Cormier is really going to be trying to march Stipe down, especially since he's the more decorated wrestler. Uh, he believes in his power and heavyweight, so he's going to throw. He's, he's going to come forward and want to throw. So that is going to be a major factor. Stipe utilizing his jab. He has to be educated with the jab. He has to watch for the the cross counters, uh, the, the overhand right. You know, he's really going to have to watch for that. And... Definitely, definitely jabbing to the head, jabbing to the body, also using a lot of leg kicks. You know, some leg kicks against Daniel Cormier will, especially in the first couple of rounds. I I feel like Cormier is such a, he's such a fighter that is dependent on pressure and heart and moving forward and constantly working and getting in the clinch and dirty boxing that you don't want to play that clinch game if you're Miosic. You know, you don't want to shy away from it, obviously, but you don't want to play the clinch game because what's the point of doing that? I mean, that's exactly where the fight ended in, in the first match. So he's better off working from distance, using front kicks, using leg kicks. I, I'm telling you, heavy, heavy leg kicks against Cormier is going to slow him down. He's not going to stop. He has a ton of heart. You know, just like we saw even Henry Cejudo got his legs beat up by Marlon Moraes in their last fight. And that didn't deter him from coming forward. But despite that, beating up the legs is, is such an important, I feel is such an important aspect for the, of this fight for Miosic. Because once he has j- just slowing down Cormier a bit, it doesn't have to take him out completely, you know. He doesn't have to destroy his leg, but he definitely has to slow it down. If he can slow down that forward march, that forward pressure, it allows him to utilize his jab a little bit more. You know, it it allows him to even set up offense, set up more offense to the head as well, just because Cormier will be a little bit slower to engage because if his legs are beaten up, slower to engage gives another person the opportunity to land more shots up top into the body as well. Uh, Cormier, you know, he's going to follow pretty much the same game plan that he did in the first fight and that he does in every fight. I think everyone kind of understands that, but I think he does, you know, you'll have to watch out for Miosic's jab. He'll have to, uh, I think he should be throwing leg kicks as well, which would be Actually, a great setup, you know, left hook to the leg kick or jab leg kick, even a, a jab cross rear rear side leg kick as well will be very effective. I think, you know, dep- it really is dependent on how Miosic kind of approaches it. If he wants to make it more of a boxing match, then definitely beating up the legs 
should be an option for Cormier. Also, just when he pressures him and gets him up against the fence, all about just work rate. Get him up against the cage. Go for the single. Go for the high crotch. Go for the double. Go back to the clinch. Dirty boxing. Rinse, repeat over and over and over again. You just want to get Miocic to just work. You know, I don't see either man really gassing out heavily in this fight, but just to get Miocic to work, to get him to think about the takedown, to get him to think about the clinch, to 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 make him feel like there's just constant volume coming his way will be super effective for Cormier. You know, I really do think that getting inside into the clinch is definitely the place that Cormier is going to want to be. He's the shorter man in this fight. And, you know, he did well in the first fight. He he completely, that the height and reach advantage didn't really matter in the first fight because he was able to get into the clinch. But if Stipe starts playing that outside long game, he's definitely going to have to, he's going to have some problems. He's definitely going to have some problems. But I would, I would suggest that he double jabs, cross to the body, hook up top, and, you know, rinse, repeat, probably do an outside leg kick to kind of, you know, when if, if, Steep, if Stipe tries to move to his left to get away from the offense, just chop him down with a right leg kick as he's exiting out, you know, and just pretty much doing anything he can to kind of corral him back to the fence where he can just crash into him, get into that clinch, you know, double jab, right hand to the body and the left hook up top would be great because the left hook. He can either use it as a legitimate hook or use it as a a way to just kind of enter into the clinch, you know, throw a hook in hook at Miosic's guard, you know, to kind of just get his hands on him. You know, just to get his hands on him. He can throw a he can do he can do a Stockton slap kind of situation like Diaz. Throw an open handed hook just so he can grab on those wrists. And pull himself towards Miosic. And once he does that, he's in the clinch. He's in the dirty boxing range, exactly where he wants to be. And that's where he can do some work. So I think this card is definitely a must see. You know, I, I there, despite even, even, even these three matches that I just broke down, if I were to even get into the Hafiala Sun Sal, Corey Sanhagen, that is going to be bonkers i think i really do think it's going to be crazy that's going to be a crazy fight a hundred percent because the sun Sao is coming off that loss to marlon marais is that was that his last fight wouldn't shock me if he fought again in between no he did that was his last fight so uh marais you know he in that marais fight got taken out pretty early you know, so I, I really do think he's going to be trying to cement himself in this fight. Um, he throws a lot of big hooks, big wind up shots from time to time. You know, there was a period where he and his brother were had a way more of a kind of karate focused base. When they'd move in and out, in and out, use a lot of distance, explode forward and then get into boxing range and start using their boxing and Muay Thai. You know, that's the kind of a sunset I think we need to see if, against Corey Sanhagen. You know, uh, Sanhagen is a mover. He's going to be moving, switching stances. Definitely has that uh, that kind of bang, Ludwig kind of approach to, to, the, to the striking. I do believe he's trains with them as well. So, yeah, Sanhagen is going to be moving around, switching stances. Strikes are going to be coming from everywhere. A sun sound needs to chop down, chop chop out Corey Sanhagen's legs and I mean really consider taking this to the ground I think he needs to play more of a control game which you know would be more I mean a lot of people wouldn't be excited for that would be boring but for some people who don't like the ground game but definitely getting him down to the ground is absolutely paramount as well as using an in and out game you know Sanhagen is going to be moving constantly on the outside he's going to be switching angles and a sun Sao just needs to kind of be cognizant of that. He can't really find himself flat-footed in this fight because Sanhagen, he has great footwork. He's going to be utilizing that at all times. He's going to try to to pressure in a way that's more about angle switching and 
and stance switching more than just walking his opponent down. He's not going to plod forward. He's not a plodder. So uh, Sanhagen is definitely going to be switching stances, moving around. Sun Sao needs to utilize the octagon, circle out, use in and out movement. When he does decide to go in, he has to commit. You know, he he needs to he needs to, that in and out movement should help to kind of throw off Sanhagen. You know, his, the the tempo. You know, that in and out movement really can mess with another fighter's tempo. So he needs to utilize that, draw Sanhagen into maybe an angle switch, pivot in, and then go for either a single double leg or inside leg kick depending on which stance Sanhagen finds himself in so that's gonna be another barn burner and you know I didn't even think I would break that down but that was just it's too enticing just too enticing not to speak on that great great fights definitely watch this one guys I'll be tuning in on Saturday night and if you like the content if you like this kind of this this longer form podcast that I'm doing right now Please like, subscribe, you know, leave leave a comment. Let me know what you think. You know, if you have any opinions on how do you how you think the fights will turn out, I would love to hear it as well. And also hit that notification bell. So every time I drop a new video, you guys can partake in the festivities. Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you in the next one.